Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach at Rhodes College, Coach Rich Duncan. Now, Coach Duncan and I have uh, a shared agreement or shared relationship. We're both Bethany alumni, so this is a fun show for me. Uh, but before we get into his show, let's talk about Rhodes College. It's located in Memphis, Tennessee. They have about 2,000 students. It's $68,000 before aid. It's about $20,000 after aid. They have a 54% acceptance rate and an 82% graduation rate. The top three majors are business admin slash management, biology, and neuroscience. Uh, you can find out all this information and more at www.roads.edu. Make sure you talk to the coach, the guidance counselor, anybody that you feel can help you make this decision. If Rhodes is where you want to go, take a look at the website and get some information. We're also going to be talking about, in the overtime segment with Serenity Brown, we're going to be talking about our partnership with QBs versus cancer. Um, so make sure you stick around. But before we get to all that, it's time to hear about Coach Duncan and how he went from Wheeling, West Virginia to Memphis, Tennessee. So without further ado, this is Coach Duncan. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach at Rhodes College, Coach Rich Duncan. Coach, thank you for joining us. Carlo, really excited to be here. Glad to do it and uh, really looking forward to the next half hour, 45 minutes. Well, Coach, we're going to do this the same way we do every week, and this is a little different because you and I share a little bit of a common experience here. How does a guy from Wheeling, West Virginia, and more specifically, what did Wally Neal say to you to get you to come up the hill to Bethany College? Yeah, you know, crazy stuff. You know, I'm originally from Martins Ferry. I was born in Wheeling, but my hometown's Martins Ferry. That's where I went to high school, and I'm still a proud Purple Rider and check the scores every week. So, uh you know, I, I actually had an older brother uh, that, that was recruited by Don Alt um, that went to Bethany, was an All-American there. And uh, in, in his time frame, Don had left Bethany and Wally took over. And um, I built a relationship with the staff, a guy by the name of Jim Meyer was the defensive coordinator and um, built a really close relationship with Jim. And um, in my recruiting, my recruiting was all over the place coming out of high school from you know, the Mid-American Conference to Davidson to, um, you know, a couple of D3s in Ohio, uh, Mount Union, and uh, Denison was another. Um, you know, I really felt like Bethany was home for me. I'd seen him play a bunch. I'd even seen my older brother play. And, um, you know, he had finished up college football right as I was finishing up high school football. So it was kind of a natural progression. Now, for those of you that don't know, there's there's really – and I don't know I, – I have an idea of what was around when you were in Bethany when I was there a lot, a little bit less, I think one store less. Um, you guys had the college in, the the bar, and then Chambers, I believe. Is there anything else that I'm missing there from the, the activities that were possible? <laughs> uh, no, you've got it all. Um, you know, the college in, uh, Chambers General Store, you could buy everything from blue jeans to a side of beef, and then uh, – you know, Bubba's Bison Inn, the legendary Bubba's Bison Inn, that uh, RIP, but it was a great place in its day. And uh, then obviously the daily walk to the post office. I don't know if that was the thing when you were there, but uh, there was no mail delivery in Bethany. So it was a pretty social outing at 11, between 11 and noon that everybody hit the post office. And at five o'clock, the streets roll up. They go, they, everybody goes to bed and that's the end of it. So coach, after your four years at Bethany, when did you start to know that coaching was going to be where you wanted to go with your career? I always knew that I wanted to coach. I really thought my track, you know, I majored in uh, sociology and secondary education, got my teaching certificate in social studies and thought I was going to go, you know, my grand plan for this whole thing was to go back to Martins Ferry High School and coach there for the rest of my life. And, um, you know, in 1990, when I graduated, there was, there wasn't a lot of teaching opportunities available. You know, there were there just wasn't a lot of jobs. I think I sent out over 400 resumes. I had two interviews, um, ended up taking a job at a, at a all dyslexic high school in Massachusetts. Um, it was a boarding school, uh, that didn't have football, um, you know, coached basketball and helped out with the baseball team for a year. But I knew in that first year, I was like, man, this is not, 
really the route for me. Um, so I started applying for graduate assistant jobs and uh, through the help of coach Neil, um, I was able to connect with a guy by the name of Steve Reese, who was taking over a program that had a 17 game losing streak and um, in Manchester, Indiana. And you know, we were able to break that streak and win three games. And um, that kind of started the bug. I, I really thought I was going to go back and coach high school football. Um, I thought this was, you know, just kind of a, a couple of year phase, but, you know, 15 years later, I looked up, I had a wife, two kids and a mortgage and I figured out, I guess this is what I'm doing now. Now, why after the one year was it time to go back to Massachusetts? Um, you know, that, that, that was kind of crazy. It was, I, I was, I met a girl at Bethany. Uh, she was originally from Philly. She had, her family had moved up into New England. We were engaged. Um, didn't know what we were going to do. Didn't know where we were going to live. We were pretty young and uh, decided I'd look for jobs in Massachusetts, see if I could find something. And was just very fortunate that UMass Lowell uh, had created a position for a young guy uh, trying to break into coaching. And, you know, I went from making $2,000 in a place to lay my head to $12,000 a year. And I thought I, you know, I thought I was stealing from the Brinks truck. Um, you know, in, in those days, I, I don't think I understood. I remember I told my my wife, uh, you know, if I make twenty thousand dollars a year, I'm going to be doing great at this thing. And the look on her face was like, uh, "Are you serious? I don't think we can raise a family on twenty thousand dollars a year." But you know, I think when I started out, that was my goal. Uh, it was more my dad ever made, and I uh, thought that's you know, I thought that was um, <laughs> doing something pretty great with your life. So uh, I thought it was well on my way in year two at twelve grand a year. Now you you spent two years there. Now, as you're going through that, are you are you working towards a master's at that point? Has it crossed your mind, or are you just working in the in the coaching field? You know, when I when I started, when I taught at the, the prep school, I did start on my master's there. Um, they had a program where you could get your master's as part of the uh, teaching deal, but uh, I kind of left it. And, um, you know, never, you know, I did end up completing it in my uh, late, early 40s, late 30s. Um, but I really didn't take any classes along the way with my jobs. It, it turned out, I felt like when I did go get my master's, I felt like not having it had eliminated me for some head coaching positions. Um, you know, at the Division three level at the time when I broke into this, everybody had another job. You coached mm -hmm. another sport, you taught classes, you know. Um, it's kind of changed a little bit at the division three level now, but, um, you know, I felt like at the time I'd been a coordinator, uh, for quite a bit at that point and I didn't have my master's and, you know, kind of got eliminated from some jobs that I thought I could have pursued. And at that point, you know, my wife and I decided I needed to go back and get it. So I went and did it uh, when I was at Loris college uh, later. And we will get down. I, I just wasn't sure if you were, you know, as you were going through, because I know that that was a requirement for a long time, right? Was that if you didn't have a master's, they didn't even really look at your at your resume. Um, now, from Massachusetts, you end up in ca at Capital. And why was Capital the next right fit for you along this journey? You want the real story, Carlo? Or do you want, do you want the public story? Uh, no, the truth of the matter is, um, we got pregnant and I uh, didn't have health insurance. And, um, you know, my wife at the time was carrying our health insurance and um, she was in between jobs when we found out we were pregnant. And at that time, pregnancy was a pre-existing condition. And uh, so when she, by, by the time she started her new job and her benefits had kicked in, uh, it wasn't going to cover the birth of my daughter. And um, it was kind of a wild story. I, I needed to go find a full-time job. I needed to make more money and uh, Capital had an old line job open. I was from Ohio. I knew some people at Capital. Um, ended up applying for and getting a job. But the crazy part of it is the law had changed while I got the job that pregnancy was no longer a pre-existing condition. And Capital picked up the birth of my daughter, so it was a win. It was I only made, you know, I made low twenties as a full-time coach, but I, I made about a hundred thousand uh, dollar bonus because you know the birth of my daughter was pretty expensive and. Right. Um, yeah, that's, I know that sounds crazy, but that's really what motivated me to look. I like Massachusetts and like the staff I was with, but, you know, I needed to do something different financially. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Now, why, after your, ta your time at Capitol, was it time to go to Wisconsin? <laughs> you know, wild story. One of the assistant ADs I was with at UMass Lowell became the AD at uw Platteville, And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a baseball background. I played baseball at Bethany, too. And uh, they had a head baseball uh, head baseball coach offensive coordinator position, and he called me and, you know, asked me if I was interested. And, you know, quite frankly, 
I didn't, I'd never been to Wisconsin. Didn't know, I kind of knew where it was on the map. I knew, I knew they were the Badgers, but I had no inkling of ever going there. And, you know, when he called me and asked me if I had an interest, um, you know, it was, a, it was a chance to, to coordinate on offense. It was a chance to run my own program. And, um, you know, it, it just worked out and it was, it was a great move. The Chicago bears had training camp there, uh, while I was there and, you know, mm-hmm. got a chance to spend a lot of time with the bear staff and, some really good coaches at the time. And, um, you know, it, it, it turned out to be a real blessing. I was glad I did it. Now, what's the the time, like when you're managing your time there, you're you're the offensive line coach and a, and a coordinator with, with the football team. And then you're also, you know, getting your feet wet and building your own baseball program and the recruiting of such. So how was that at, at, while you were going through those two coaching positions? You know, looking back at it, it was, uh, you know, it, it was awesome. Um, I learned a lot of things, you know, made some mistakes that, you know, obviously I think have helped me later in my career. But, you know, it was wild on, on game day Saturday. You know, I had a full blown college baseball practice going on at 8 a.m. Um, and I would be there if it was a home game. Uh, I was there until we had to get ready to play the game and my guys were still playing. Uh, I had an assistant that would, you know, help me out and stay. And if we were on the road, um, you know, I had an assistant and I had to count on my players, you know, kind of keeping things going with the practice and, um, you know, the recruiting, the cycles, the way they worked at that point in time in division three, they kind of, you know, we did a lot of summer baseball recruiting, um, and a lot of winter football recruiting. So it all kind of worked out that, you know, I just recruited all year round. Um, you know, you never stop. You were just recruiting two sports and, um, you know, it wasn't unheard of. There's a lot of people who did it that way. I don't, you know, there wasn't a cell, there was, the cell phone thing didn't exist yet. You know, you called people on a telephone and you sent them letters and, um, you know, the, it was an instant communication like it is today. Um, I don't know that you can do that in today's world. There's just too many, you know, too many contacts to handle, uh, just a lot coming your way. Right. Now, after ten, four years. At Platteville. Sorry, my yep. math math in my head wasn't going fast. Um, after the four years at Platteville, why was it time to move move on? And you already answered my follow up on that. You got your master's there, obviously, so that you could take the next logical step in a coaching career. Yeah, you know, my my daughter um, my daughter was in in preschool at Platteville, and it was great. We had one child. Um, my wife worked at the university. I worked at the university. My daughter was in the preschool, so I could go pick her up and, you know, take her to the baseball field, the football field, all those things. But, you know, my, my, my wife was pregnant with my son. Um, I, I knew at some point we weren't going to be able to raise two kids and me coach two sports and all those things. And I was able to, um, you know, I knew the staff at Loris. I knew the guys there. I worked summer camps with them and the same thing, their old line guy uh, had gotten out of coaching and, um, you know, they were looking for a guy and it was a football only position. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it was a tough decision. You know, I'm not going to lie to you, Carlo. I really liked the baseball team. My coach, we were able to, in my time there, you know, knock off the number one team in the country. Um, you know, we, we were a middle of the pack team, but we, we had some pretty good players and we were able to go get some big wins. I had a good staff. I was able to hire a guy um, <clears throat> that had played minor league baseball. And, you know, he did a great job for me. And, um you know, it it was a tough decision to leave, but I think it was the right one for my family. You know, my son was born uh, in 2000, right when I made the move. And, um, you know, we were able to, we didn't have to move. It was 30 minutes down the road. You know, we could stay in the same place. And, uh, you know, it it just made a lot of sense uh, for a as a family. And then obviously three years, four years later, you, you get the first head coaching position at Aurora. Um, why was Aurora the right fit? And talk to us a little bit about, was that interview process um, similar to the one that you went through at Rhodes? And I guess my follow-up on that is, is it, do you talk about football a lot in those interviews or is it more, what are we doing with the program? What's the education going to look like? Study tables, et cetera. Yeah. You know, the, the Aurora interview, um, you know, I, I was looking for a head job. I actually, at Loris, I was the offensive coordinator. Chris Kleiman, who's the head coach at Kansas State, was the defensive coordinator at the time. And, uh, you know, our head coach who'd been there, he started the program, was the only head coach and after the restart. You know, they'd had football prior to World War II at Loris, but in World War II, they dropped football like a lot of schools, and then they brought it back in the 80s. And 
Bob Beery was the guy's name. He's, he's still a mentor. It was his birthday yesterday. Shout out to Coach Beery. I talked to him yesterday. But, uh, you know, he retired. And, uh, you know, both Chris and I were candidates for the job. Chris ended up getting it. And I knew at that point I would have stayed with Chris. Chris was a close friend. Uh, but I was involved in the Aurora job. And um, at that point, you know, I, the interview process, you know, I, I interviewed for the Bethany head job a little bit later. But, you know, th those interviews, um, they're never about what kind of offense and what kind of defense you run. They, they want to know what kind of person you are. They want to know, you know, how you're going to run the program, how you're going to treat kids. You know, what, what are your goals? You know, what, what's the academic outcomes that you're looking for? And um, they're pretty grueling. They're Most of the time they're, you know, a full day. Um, you know, they start early in the morning. They don't end till after dinner. And um, you meet a lot of people. You know, there's a lot of constituencies that are involved in a, you know, a college head coaching job. And, um, you know, that one, you know, the Aurora one was actually a multi-day interview because the president wasn't available the day I interviewed. So I had to go back another day and, you know, meet with the president. And that was a, right. you know, three and a half, four hour meeting. So, um, you know, that, that was a long and grueling process and it was a roller coaster of emotion. I wasn't sure if I wanted to leave. Uh, I thought we had a pretty good football team at, at Loris at the time. You know, our head coach had retired. Good friend of mine got the head coaching job. Um, but I also knew I wanted to run my own program. And, you know, it was it was we we're going to have to move my family. Uh, we'd been in the same place for eight or nine years. My daughter had been in the same school, uh, all the school system all the way through. Mm -hmm. And we we're going to have to make that change. And, um, you know, I wasn't sure, but it, it turned out to be the right move at the time. And, you know, six years there and former guest of the show, Coach K over there at Barry. Why was it time after the six years? Why did you end up going with Coach K over there to uh, to Georgia? Well, you know, they say there's two kind of coaches, those that have been fired and those that are going to be fired. And after, you know, whatever, I think it was 19 or 20 years of coaching, whatever it was at the time I was in, I finally got myself fired and became part of the Fired Football Coaches Association. And, um, you know, we'd had a good run there. Um, we, we'd won some football games, been in the national playoffs. I've been coach of the year, but it, it just wasn't working. Um and, you know, sometimes that happens. It just, you know, I probably out outstayed my welcome and um, it, it worked out uh, for me in the end. You know, I interviewed Tony K uh, two years prior to be my defensive coordinator at Aurora. I knew him. We had a common thread in our coaching tree and uh, I'd never met him in person, but he was from Pittsburgh, played at Grove City and, uh, you know, he's still, but, you know, in the coaching world, Tony K is one of my best friends in the whole world. And I didn't know him before I went to Barry. And, um, you know, I'd actually, we had talked on the phone and uh, he called me and told me that he was going to hire somebody else, uh, a guy by the name of Joe White, who was the head coach at Rhodes at one point. And uh, Joe had recruited Tennessee and then it had worked out. Joe's son was playing at Birmingham Southern. Joe had accepted the job. And then two days later, their offensive coordinator left at Birmingham Southern and Joe wanted to go coach his son. So I was actually interviewing on at another job and was leaving the interview, driving to the airport. And Tony K called me and asked me, Hey, are you still interested in this job? Um, because something's changed. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was kind of crazy. It was, you know, a wild time. I was unemployed um, and didn't really know my daughter was going to be a senior in high school. And I didn't know what was next. And that turned out to be the biggest blessing in my life. It was, you know, I made some of the best friends I've ever made, coached some of the most special teams I've ever coached. And, um, you know, I know you had Coach McCollum on from Swanee, which is a big rival of ours. And we recruited his son to play for us at Barry. I was his recruiter, um, you know, and it, my daughter was worked in football operations there. We started a program and, um, you know, it just couldn't have worked out any better. And, you know, sometimes, you know, God's plan is always perfect and you don't know what it's going to be, but it was perfect for me in that moment in time. And I was, it was a heck of a, you know, it was a heck of an opportunity. And I didn't, didn't know anything about Barry College, I'd never been to Georgia. Um, you know, I flew in, met Tony K. We drove, drove to campus. We drove onto campus and I thought to myself, dear Lord, I better not screw this interview up, uh, because this place is beautiful. And I think we might be able to win some football games here. And it, you know, didn't know how long I was going to be there, whether it was going to be a year, a month, um, there was no players we had to recruit for a year before we started, but, um, it turned out to be a nine year run and it was a heck of a run for us. Now, coach, before we get into Rhodes, I want to ask you, you've been in a couple different areas 
that have different styles of football. You, you obviously you come from Ohio, that Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, the tri-state area. Then you go to Bethany. Now, then you go up to Mass, which is a little bit different type of football than you would play necessarily over in Wisconsin. Um, and then Southern football has got to be different than all. What's the what's the biggest difference between all the places that you've been style wise of football? You know, I, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I think probably uh, the biggest difference is when you're in the upper Midwest, the size of the players is different. You know, when, when I was in Wisconsin State League, our offensive linemen, defensive linemen, tight ends were enormous. You know, we were right. big. It, you know, we were just, it, we looked like a bunch of lumberjacks. Um, you know, when, when when I coached, when I got down south, the thing that jumped out at me immediately was the amount of speed that was on the field. Um you know, maybe the, the, the linemen, you know, I kind of joke, I'm an old line guy by trade. All the linemen thought they could throw and catch when I got down south. And it wasn't the same when I was in Chicago or Wisconsin or, you know, Ohio. The linemen, you know, they were, they, they were kind of proud to be linemen. Um, right. You know, we had to kind of create a culture um, that, hey, it's okay to be an offensive lineman and to be a tough dude. And, um, and, and I think that was, you know, I, the guys love football everywhere I've ever been. Massachusetts, we had a great group. We had a good run there. And, had some really good players. Um, you know, I, I think the common denominator is all the kids really love football. You know, they, mm -hmm. they might have some different skill sets. They might have some different things. But, you know, I think as a coach, it's been great for me because I've learned a lot of different styles of football. You know, I've learned how to put, you know, 11 people in the box and run the ball. And I've learned how to spread it out and go five wide empty and throw it. And, um, you know, it, it's just it, it's been a great learning experience for me because I've seen a lot of different styles of football through my career and never really thought about it till you asked the question, Carlo. But, um, you know, it, it really there has been some real differences for sure. Now, talk to us after the nine years. Why when this position opened up, why was it time you and Coach K again? He said the same. He he had nothing but praise for you on in his show. You talked about him very similar, and you can see that camaraderie. But why was it time for you to move on and and take that stab again at being a head coach? You know, it. I I don't know if I really wanted to be a head coach again, Carlo, but. I knew if I was going to do it, my shelf life was about at that point. You know, I'm in the mid fifties. And um, at the time I was, when I took this job, I was early fifties and um, I'd said no to four or five other opportunities. Um, you know, they just weren't better than the situation I was in. And, you know, Rhodes, you know, this is crazy, but Rhodes, Rhodes is always, my path has always connected me to Rhodes people. And I'd never, you know, didn't know anybody prior to me getting into college coaching who was from Rhodes, other than there was a guy by the name of Dave Waddle, who was the admissions director at Bethany that left Bethany to come to Rhodes back in the eighties. I knew him. He recruited my older brother was the admissions guy there um, at the time. And I got to meet him. He was an Olympian and, you know, kind of a cool story, but um, you know, as my path kept going, I kept running into these Rhodes people. And when I came to Rhodes the first time to play, we were in the same league. It, it just had this feeling of, man, this place is a really nice place. If this job ever opens up and it, you know, I'm a legitimate candidate. I think it's something I'll pursue. And, um, you know, they, it, it just turned out, you know, again, I, I don't know if I was the first choice for this job. They they had some really good candidates, you know, it was coming out of COVID. Uh, we, you know, the, the world kind of went upside down during COVID. We played a spring season. Um, you know, at Barry, we'd won five straight conference championships at the time when we finished that COVID year. Uh, I'd had a pretty good run in the playoffs. And, you know, I always said, you know, I would stay with Tony K as long as he needed me. And I, I felt like, I, I don't know if he, I, I, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but um, I felt like, I, like he didn't really need me. He, he figured out how to be a great head coach. And, um, you know, I think the one asset I brought to the staff is I had head coaching experience. And, you know, anytime you're a head coach, when you have somebody on your staff who's been in that seat, who knows the different problems you have, and until you've sat in the seat, you really don't know it. Um, right. And, uh, you know, when Tony K got hired at Barry, it was his first job, and he needed, uh, he felt like he needed somebody on the staff who'd been through it. And, you know, I, I feel like we really worked well together, but um, I would have stayed, you know, I, I don't think if it wasn't the Rhodes job, I'd probably still be there. Mm -hmm. Um, but this job was just too good to pass up. Um, I felt like I could make a difference here. You know, they'd struggled a little bit. 
I felt like I knew the recruiting area. I felt like I knew uh, the roster, and I felt like I could make a difference here in the program. And I just, you know, God calls us to be different places at different times. And, um, you know, I felt the pull. And, you know, again, I don't think I was the first choice. I think there were some other people, and they called me up. And the interview process was way different than the other ones. Um, you know, I talked to the athletic director. Uh, we had a nice conversation on the phone, and, you know, I, I I got I jumped on a Zoom with the committee the next day, and we talked for about an hour. And then I drove over. I think I talked to him on a Thursday night. I drove over on a Sunday night because uh, we had a recruiting weekend that weekend, so I couldn't get out of there until we were done recruiting. And uh, interviewed Monday, met with people, uh, worked out a deal over a, a bar napkin in the hotel lobby um, Tuesday morning when we got done. And, um, you know, really a guy by the name of Matt Dean, who was a longtime coach, was the athletic director at the time. He's Step back. Now he's still with us, but he works in facilities as associate uh, director of athletics. But, you know, I had a good bond with him. I had a good bond uh, with the guys that were on the committee. And one of the guys on the committee is now the AD. He was our fundraiser at the time and stepped into the AD role after I assumed the job. But, you know, some people would say I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I took a leap of faith. Um, we were going through a presidential change. We were going through an athletic director change. Um we were going through an admissions director change all at the same time when I took the job and we were coming out of COVID. And I don't know if you draw a blueprint up to be a head coach. Um, I don't know if you want all those three things to be up in the air because they're all pretty important to you being successful in the football. But I felt good enough about the school and the job and it's all worked out. And, you know, pretty happy that it has. Now, Coach, what are we looking for other than the guy got to be able to play football? What are you looking for in a Lynx player? Yeah, you know, we we start everything here. This is a, you know, it's an elite academic school. Um, you know, we're, you know, you you've got to be able to make it here academically, and that, right? You know, that's a twenty seven plus, twenty eight plus ACT type of guy. You know, a guy that's had multiple um, advanced placement courses in his high school career. So, you know, it really it really limits our pool, uh, and we have to cast a wide net. We recruit semi nationally. If you Take a you know line from San Antonio, Texas to um, Jacksonville, Florida, and then make it a triangle up to Chicago. That's our recruiting area. Um, okay. We do we do get outside of that footprint. You know we do have you know we had a Hawaiian kid that just graduated a year ago. We'll you know we had a, we'll have California kids. We'll have New England kids. Um, so it's a wide net, but um, you know we start with can they do it here academically? And mm -hmm. you know I, I don't want to invest all the time and effort that it takes to get a guy to come to Rhodes and them not be able to succeed. So um, we start there. Obviously, you turn the film on. they got to be able to play there. Um, and then from a character standpoint, we're going to talk to all their high school coaches and make sure they're the type of guys we're looking for. You know, you got to be a competitor. You've got to be tough. Um, you know, I, when, when I got here, um, they, they've lost, I think, 14 out of 16 games. And uh, we've been able to turn that around. And we've turned it around because our kids have played really hard and you know, they've committed to the program and to each other. And, um, you know, I know that's a lot of coach speak, but, um, you know, I think we live it every day. And, you know, right now we're one and two and, you know, I've had two really tough losses where I feel like, you know, take a five minute stretch out of both games and we're, we have an opportunity to win both. Um, but our kids are pretty resilient. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the other piece we're looking for kids that, um, you know, or looking for more, you know, I, I say this all the time. I, I love football with all of my heart and it's, it's how I've made a living, but I think I'm more than that. Um, I've got a liberal arts education and I want kids that, that love football with all their heart, but they want more than that too, that they understand right. that when this is over, this is over. And, um, it's a part of who they are and it's part of, you know, who they'll always be, but it's only a part and there's more to life than just playing football. Now, coach, Obviously, with being a high academic school, uh, I know next year, 2025, there's a lot of talks about this enrollment cliff that we're, we're now at the precipice of. Um, is that something that you guys are are talking about? Is that more of an admissions thing? Um, and how do you think that's going to affect numbers for you guys and, and maybe across the board? Yeah, you know... <laughs> I think everybody in higher education is talking about the enrollment cliff right now. Uh, it's the buzzword, but um, you know, I, football recruiting, football recruiting. I don't know necessarily. Uh, I think you have a niche, right? You know, kids want to come in, they want to play football. I don't. I don't think the numbers of football players are dwindling. Uh, recruitable. 
but certainly from an enrollment standpoint, I think everybody's a little nervous about that. And, um, you know, it's kind of like musical chairs, right? You know, you gotta, you gotta hope you have a seat with all the kids that are there. And, uh, you know, I think the, you know, the FAFSA, what, what's happened with the FAFSA over the last year has also not helped uh, college recruiting. It, it, you know, the, you know, the high end private school that has a little higher price tag. Um, you know, there's been a lot more, at least from what I've seen, a lot more high school seniors who've chosen to take a gap year, uh, even in this past recruiting cycle, because the financial aid process was just too cumbersome. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's, you know, that's above my pay grade, but certainly I know those conversations are out there, Carlo. And, um, you know, I think everybody, you'd be foolish not to have your eyes on, you know, how that's going to impact higher education over the next 10, 15 years. Right. All right, coach. So the 2023 season, six and four, four and four in the conference. What were your final thoughts uh, once we finished, once everything settled, and then we'll jump into 2024? Yeah, you know, I, I thought that, um, you know, we were we were legitimately two plays away from being eight and two. We lost, a, you know, we, we had a game-winning field goal opportunity against Center College at home early in the season. We missed it. It was a tie ball game. Uh, you know, we centered the ball with, you know, I don't know, 10 seconds left and the kid just pushed it right. It was a tough miss. Um, and then we ended up getting beaten triple overtime. And uh, then later in the season at Hendricks, um, you know, we scored with 11 seconds to go, chose to go for two down one and didn't get it. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, we were, you know, you look in three years from when I got here, you know, the, the, the competitiveness of their COVID season, they were 0-4 and didn't score until – you know, late in the third game, um, you know, we'd come a long way. I felt pretty good about that. Um, you know, now, once those seasons are over, Carlo, you know, it's on to the next one. You're going to graduate. And, you know, the unique thing in college football that's probably different from pro football is, you know, you, you don't have an opportunity to re-sign your seniors. Um, right. They're, they're going to go away. They're going to graduate. you got to go get new ones. And, you know, in, in pro football, they might bring in, you know, you might add, you know, five, six rookies to your roster, five, six free agents. Uh, but the core of your roster year in and year out is going to stay. And you kind of know what's coming back every year. You got to readjust it to college level and um, you got to reload. We're, we don't live in the transfer portal. Our academics don't lend to living in the transfer portal. So, you know, we, we want to recruit high school seniors and we want to, you know, bring guys in that can be four year contributors in our program. And, um, you know, we feel like we've been able to do that. Uh, we're in, you know, really my third year, you know, we've recruited my third class now. Um, but the first class, we were really late. You know, this is a summer recruiting job. Um, you know, we, we had over 200 kids visit in this summer, uh, whereas my first summer I got hired in May. Uh, my staff didn't get here until July 4th, and I think we had like 15 or 20 kids visit that summer. Um, so we're really, you know, we've got two full recruiting classes. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and the seniors here, I've been the only head coach that, you know, they've ever had, uh, but I wasn't the head coach that recruited them. Um, you know, they're my play. I tell them all the time. I love them. Like I recruited you, but you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're, we're still working on building depth of the roster and, um, you know, trying to get to that point. I think to be really good in division three football, you have to be fully too deep. You know, I, you know, I've been in some places where we've been able to be nationally competitive and, um, you know, when you're fully too deep and your special teams are fully stocked, uh, then you have a chance to go out and, you know, win nine, 10 games. And, you know, right. we're still working to get there. Well, coach, you kind of lent in to my first question about 2024. When this episode airs, you guys will go be going into the Hendricks college game. I guess there's, uh, there's, there's definitely some, some motivation built in, right. For, to get a win uh with the way last season ended and then uh obviously so far this season I, like i i've watched both of the losses i didn't get the chance to watch the austin college game but the two losses you're right it's a five minute gap here five minute gap there and it's a completely different football game what are we expecting out of hendrix yeah you know hendrix is a well first of all uh let me say this um you know there are some five minute stretches and i, and I talked to my, our team last night you know um you got to eliminate the five minute stretches. Uh, right. you know, we got a good football team. We, we do. We have a good football team. Um, but we, we haven't played cleanly 
Um, and nobody's going to play perfect, but we haven't played cleanly and we've let mistakes kind of compound, you know, against Wash U, we had, you know, two major errors in the kicking game in the third quarter after having the lead at half. And then, you know, last week, um, you know, we had a turnover and a turnover on downs back to back after not being able to punch it in up a score coming out of half and getting the ball. Um, so, you know, we, we've got to clean that up, but, you know, getting to Hendricks, you know, it's been a fun rivalry. You know, I've played three times here and, you know, the first year we won and I believe double overtime at home in the night game. The last two years we played at War Memorial Stadium over in Little Rock and, uh, we played a barn burner, I think seven to six. It was it was a snooze fest uh, for the fans. It was a seven to six. Just nobody could move the ball anywhere, and the defense has played great. And then last year we got beat fifty to forty nine in a tennis match. Um, it's a rivalry game, um, you know. For you know that that's for particularly for Hendricks. It seems like when I got the roads, I didn't know this, but we're a rivalry game for a lot of people, um, and it, it's kind of interesting. Um, but, you know, for Hendricks, this is a big game for them. And, you know, so it's got to be a big game for us. And, right. uh, you know, it's going to be a night game at home. And, you know, we're really looking forward to it. Uh, they've got a really talented quarterback. Kid can really throw it. They, you know, their head coach, Buck Buchanan, is another good friend, a uh, really good football coach. And, um, you know, I, I think that they'll, they'll be ready to play us. And, you know, we'll be ready to play them. And I think it'll be a, a heck of a football game. Now, Coach, the other big thing for 2024, there was there was two big rule additions, I guess. One's not a really a rule addition. It's the the expansion of the playoffs from the 32 to the 40. I'll start there. Was that was it long overdue for that with the amount of schools that we have and the amount of schools that we're getting in? Or do you fall in? And I've had coaches previously, you know, win your conference and you, that conversation doesn't have to happen. Yeah, you know, I, I'm uniquely I've been in Division three for. 35 36 years and then I played in it so probably closer to you know 48 or 38 years or so and um you know back in the day it was 16 teams um and it was really difficult to get in and you know and then there were some real mismatches because it was you know win your conference and you're in but you know not every conference is the same um you know I, then it expanded we did a great job of getting it pushed out to 24, I believe. And then it got pushed out a little bit further to 32. Um, and, you know, I, I will tell you, you know, you can make the tournament as big as you want. There's always going to be somebody who gets left out. Right. Um, but there were, you know, I, I can tell you for a fact, there, there were two or three teams that got left out of this thing last year that, you know, had a legitimate shot to go two or three rounds deep into the playoffs. And, um, you know, I, the, you know, kind of the model in Division Three has been everybody's trying to push to get the AQ, so there's been conference realignment, and then there's some really good at-large teams that you know lose a conference championship by a score or less against a really good football team. I, I think you know when you look up in the CCIW with Wheaton and North Central, when you look at um, you know the Ohio Athletic Conference with John Carroll, Mount Union, Baldwin Wallace, and whoever else is fighting there, and uh, you know, and I think down here in the in the South, I think one of the tough things is we've got a really good league in the SAA. Uh, we, you know, we've got some teams that have won playoff games, but when you become an island, you know, when you're in the South, when you're in Texas, when you're in California, because of the matchups, sometimes, you know, the distance of travel, it's been tough to get that second team in out of the league, and uh, you know, there's not enough crossover to know hey, how do we stack up against the Centennial or how do we stack up against, you know, some of the other good leagues, you know, the the not the elite, but the really good leagues and, you know, how do our number two teams match up against their number two teams and because the distance of travel for non-conference games is just too far. And right. uh, so I, I think the expansion is a really good move. Um, I think we'll find out in three or four years, you know, how, how do that, how do those extra eight, because really the extra eight getting in are probably going to be lower tiered conference champions because some of those other teams probably should have already been in based right. on their ability and their strength of schedule and, you know, who they play. They just were eliminated by, you know, th this, this race for the AQ in conference building. So I, 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 if you ask me if I'm in favor, absolutely. I don't know if you can go much deeper than 40, you know, I, I don't know how that works, but I think it's a good move. I remember being at 16 and having the argument at the AFCA convention a long time ago and 
you know, Kenny O'Keefe was the head coach at Allegheny at the time and was really passionate about his argument and why, you know, why, why we weren't meeting in football, the, you know, the number of participation for the postseason uh, compared to other sports. And, you know, it was a really logical argument, We you know, at the time. And um, I, I think that argument still exists. I think we're much closer to the, you know, that, that percentage of participation among right. other sports in, in their playoffs now. And I think it's a good thing. And then the other, uh, the, the rule change or addition to, to you coaches on the sideline, uh, the ability to have up to 18 iPads. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take a stab. Everybody I've talked to said they're not fully utilizing all 18 iPads because it is division three and budgets are what they are. Um, where do you guys fall on the technology specifically? Where do you fall on adding iPads to the sideline to see plays after, after they've been done? You know, I, I'm, I, I will go on record with this, Carlo. I'm 100% against it. Um, I, one, I don't think we have the staffing to make it work. Two, um, I, I think I've hired a staff here that has coached a lot of college football. And, you know, part of the reason I hired the staff I hired was because they've coached a lot of college football games. And, um, you know, I think that when you get the iPad out, you know, it, you you you're taking away from the guys experience and what they've done in coaching and um you know and that's not the only reason i think it's great for the kids you know they get a chance to see it and the kids have become way more technologically savvy um in the world and it's great for them to watch the video on the sideline but um you know we're very limited i i think we're rolling two ipads on the sideline one for offense one for defense and um you know we just don't have the staffing to be able to do it. I, I would, you know, me personally, I'd much rather have communication with our, with our quarterback and our linebacker uh, than sideline replay. And, you know, I, I just happened to tell the game officials before our um, game over at Shenandoah, um, you know, I'm not a big believer in the replay system in general. Um, you know, this is a human game. It's played by humans and there's human error. And the day that, you know, my players don't make a mistake or I don't make a mistake as a coach, then I'll hold the, the officials to the, you know, you can't make a mistake either. Um, it's a human game. And, you know, one of the toughest losses I've ever taken and probably led to me getting dismissed in, in my head job at Aurora in some ways is we caught a touchdown pass where a kid was in bounds and he was ruled out of bounds. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, do I hate it in that situation? Yeah. But the official wasn't trying to cheat us. He did, you know, it was in a tough, it was a tough call in the back of the end zone and he missed it. And, uh, that's life. You know, I think, I think part of that with coaching baseball and playing baseball, you know, the home plate umpire is going to see 400 pitches during a game. I, my expectation is you're not going to get 400 right in the strikes and balls. I want him to be as accurate as he can be and um, do the best job and be consistent. And, you know, I think sometimes we're asking, you know, we're asking officials to be superhuman when that's just not the case, you know, and it, I think it's driven people away from wanting to be officials. Um, mm -hmm. And when you look at the high school game and, you know, where, where there's a shortage of officials and, you know, at the end of the day, get, guys are out there because they love it and they're not out there to get yelled at and screamed at and cussed at. And, um, you know, so we, we've taken, and I get it. HD TVs changed a lot of things. You know, when, when back in the day when the set, you know, when you're watching KDKA uh, on rabbit ears, you couldn't see if the guy's foot was in bounds or out of bounds when the Steelers were playing. But now with HD TV, you know, they can slow that thing down to the minutia. And <laughs> I don't know in, in real time, can the official really see that? I don't know. He's got to do the best job and be in position. And, you know, I don't know. I don't understand where the world's moved that we can't live with guys working their tail off to be great at what they do. And, you know, if they miss one, they miss one. My quarterback's not going to be a hundred percent in every throw that he makes either. So, uh, you know, you, that's kind of my take on it, but um, yeah, I know it's not going away either. I, I, if, if I sit here and try to say, I don't want it, that's great, but I, it's going to make me a dinosaur. Um, so I've got to be able to adjust and move, but we're going to do it very, you know, we're, we're doing it too. You know, we, we didn't go buy a replay system because I don't, I'm not convinced that across the landscape of division three, that people are going to want this after doing it for a year without help. So we're, we're doing it. We're, we're basically shooting video off an iPad and sending it up to a cloud and, um, you know, getting it that way. And it's working fine for us. It's a little bit slow. You know, last week we had a 20 play drive. It takes a minute to get 20 plays up on a cloud. Right. Um, 
but outside of that, you know, we haven't really had a lot of problems and it's working for us and it's, you know, giving us the best we can, you know, what we can work with. And um, I, I just think probably made this decision too quickly for, for our level. I don't think people thought about support staff and what it takes to get this thing rolling. Now you brought up another interesting one, the, the communication, which is now legal at the, at the, the division one level is that next on the docket to trickle down to and, and do you think that that will be so to speak rushed out because i also agree i think making a decision in april and expecting everybody to magically have things ready by by august that that's not a lot la large time frame to get things moving right yeah you know i think the headphone communication is way easier i think most headphone companies now have a way to be able to add that into your headphone communication system pretty seamlessly. Um, you know, I, I don't think the expense is exorbitant. Um, so yeah, I think that's coming. Um, you know, I, I think it's actually pretty, it, it, I've, I've researched it. I've researched both of them. I think the the headphone communication thing is way simpler than the sideline replay, um, uh, because okay. it doesn't take any additional people to run it. So they so, just, uh, yeah, when that's going, they they have direct communication to you, and it would be what fifteen seconds. That's it. We're cutting it so yeah. that so same way as it would be. Yep, yeah. and you know actually we, we when we played Shenandoah in the ODAC, they are testing it right now, and uh, we allowed them even though we didn't have it, we allowed them to use it because it, you know I, I wasn't going to make them try to play a game differently than the way they're going to play the rest of the year. Um, I'd love to have had it. I tried to work. <laughs> I tried to figure out a way to get it for us in the game, but I just wasn't able to pull it off. And, um, you know, I, I still, they were still signaling from the sideline. So I don't know if it was seamless for them yet. And I talked to their coach and he said there was some human error, uh, some trial, you know, just figuring out how to use it. But, um, you know, I think that's a much simpler answer. And I think it probably would help us all way more. Uh, you know, we, the whole sig signal stealing thing would kind of, quiet itself down once you have in in helmet communication with the player right coach what's the significance for you of division three uh it's been my whole life um you know i i've listened to some of your other podcasts and there's been you know coach max been at the division one level for most of his career and uh but you know i i really believe in the student athlete model i believe in the pureness of what we're doing i you know i I think anybody would be foolish to tell you that they don't want to run out, uh, the, you know, of, of Ohio State Stadium, Ohio State, Michigan, or, you know, Penn State when they're doing a whiteout or Wisconsin to jump around or, you know, the LSU and the Bengal Tigers at the visitor's locker room. You know, there's a lot of cool things in college football, but, you know, I really believe in this model where we are developing young men. Um, you know, I, I think the game was invented to develop young people, uh, particularly men. And, you know, when you look at when football grew, when it really be, started to become popular was at the end of World War II, when there were a lot of young guys that their their, their fathers had passed away at war and, you know, guys were in this to really help bring people up. And, um, you know, I think Division Three is still that. It's pure. Um, you know, kids are here because they want to be here. They love the game and they don't want, they don't want it to be done. And, you know, I've been able to recruit some guys that, quite frankly, have turned down scholarships to come to the Division three level because I think the education piece was what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, to me, um, I, there's nothing better than, you know, that first or second weekend in May when your guys walk across the stage and you know that whatever's next for them is way bigger than what we did here. And mm -hmm what we did here was pretty big. And I, I know that, um, you know, division three, like I said, I, it's been my whole life. Uh, and, and I've stayed here intentionally. I've had opportunities to work up at higher levels. Um, you know, I, you know, my, my uncle was a head coach in the NFL. Um, you know, I've had some ties to be able to work up to that level, but it's just not really what I've wanted. And, um, I know people think I'm crazy when I say that, uh, but but I really like this level of football. I, I I like I like where we're at. I like that there's balance. I like that you know the academics really are important, and uh, the you know the degrees that they're chasing really are they're serious about it. All right, coach. So now it's the fast five. You could live anywhere yep. in the world. Where would it be and why? 
Uh, I would have to say um, probably Jacksonville, Florida, just because my daughter's there teaching school and I uh, love the ocean. And, um, you know, I, I, Jacksonville's kind of my place. So um, it's my vacation spot and I'd be there for sure. What's the most important lesson that you've learned over your career? Um, with the relationships with the players are the most important thing in this. Um, you know, when I jumped into this, I thought it was about how much football I knew and what, what the X's and O's were. And, um, you know, that my scheme was better than their scheme. And all those things are important. But at the end of the day, if you don't have great relationships with the players you coach, um, nothing else really matters. You're not, you know, the old saying, they, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, I think that really holds true. And, uh, you know, as, I, as I've progressed and gone through my coaching career, um, it, that becomes more and more evident every day to me. If you weren't coaching, what would you be doing? You know, <laughs> um, I joked for a long time I would drive the Budweiser truck. Uh, that would be that would be my job. Uh, walk in and talk to people and del deliver the, the the barley pop and um, maybe the Iron City truck. I don't know. They, now that they're making it again. Maybe the Iron City truck. I'd be good there, but. Uh, no, I, I really don't know. I we we had a guest coach last night um, to come in and talk to our team, and he he's a director of community engagement at Old Miss, and this guy played here. He's my age, uh, graduated from Rhodes in '90, and um, you know I had a chance to have dinner with him after it, and you know he's doing a lot of great things with you know social change and um, diversity and inclusion, and I think that would, I think probably in all seriousness, that's probably where I would be. Um, you know, I happened to, you know, I was born within a couple of weeks of Dr. King's assassination. And, you know, part of the thing that I love about Memphis is all the history that's here from from Native American history to civil rights history. And, um, you know, I got a degree in sociology from Bethany. And um, I really think it would probably be in some other way helping folks and, and working with people in that, in that regard. Now, I do have to tell you the answer to that question that we've gotten just to connect from your resume to, to end this or to wrap this question up. Um, the coach currently at Platteville told us that him and his brother have gone in depth looking at being garlic farmers because garlic continues to pay. And <laughs> I just like to throw that out there every once in a while, because I've heard a lot of answers to that question. The garlic farmer one just really stands out. <laughs> You know, really funny, Carlo, Ryan Munz is, uh, or Jason Munz's is brother, Ryan, I recruited to play baseball at Platteville. Um, so it, it, it's, um, you know, it's a small world around here. And um, I'd left, I'd left before Munzee came in and played quarterback there, but I know him really well. And I'm not shocked at all that their answer was garlic farmer, just knowing their family. Coach, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Who? Um, you know, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would, I, I think I'd have to say, um, you know, probably, I, I don't know if compliment guys that come back and, uh, when you see them five, 10, 15 years later and, you know, they've had their own kids and, um, they, they, they thank you for what, what, what you did for them. And, um, you know, that does matter. Um, you know, I hope that, um, I hope that I've been able to make an impact in guys' lives and, um, you know, it feels good, you know, when you get a text message and email and, you know, guys just say, thanks. Um, you know, I think that's a big one. And then the other side of compliments, what's the best slash we're still working out the kinks on the way we ask this question, but what's the best worst insult you've ever received? Oh, heck man. I <laughs> You coach college football long enough, man. You get them all. I, I, I'll tell you a great story. I don't know. Uh, I was coaching at UMass Lowell, and um, you know, we were having a struggle on offense. And you know, I, I was the offensive coordinator, and uh, maybe not entitled, but they they were they they were tearing they were just tearing me up. Um, and I married a girl that grew up uh, on the south side of Philadelphia, and uh, she happened to be sitting there. And um, you know, the, the amount of time that we spend away from our families, and you know, my daughter was really young, and um, 
So they're just tearing me up. And finally she had enough and she lit him up and it turned out he was a VP of the school. Um, so I, I don't know. I had to I had to talk to her about how maybe maybe you shouldn't sit with the other folks in the stands. So they're, they're going to do this every week. You know, they don't they, you know, the toughest job in football is to be an offensive coordinator. You know, nobody yells at the defensive coordinator that, hey, you should have blitzed there. You should have done this. But everybody knows what play you should call when you're the offensive coordinator. And if play goes for no yards, they're telling you it's the wrong one. And, um, you know, I, I you know, I, I got a couple really funny ones, but uh, I think that was probably the best one because uh, mama wasn't happy. Uh, I'm gone all week and somebody's just tearing me up in the stands and uh, she's got a little girl with her. doesn't see her dad a whole lot during the season. And uh, she, she didn't, she didn't quite like it. So I, I was, I was proud of her and appreciated it. Uh, but then, you know, we had to talk about maybe sitting, sitting somewhere away from the rest of the folks uh, for the rest maybe, of my career. Maybe sitting over here or over, just don't <laughs> sit right there. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. All right, coach. The last question we've asked everybody. Was there a question that you were expecting me or anticipating me asking you? And if so, how would you have answered it? Um, I don't know if I was expecting. I, I, I've watched the previous broadcast, so I knew this was coming. And I, I don't really know, but um, I figured you were probably going to ask me what, what, what my uh, fraternity affiliation was at Bethany. Um, I don't know if you were in a fraternity or not, but I happened to be a beta in the time I was there. And, um, so that, that that's what I was probably expecting that you would ask since that was something that was pretty common at Bethany at the time. We were, we were at different ends of town. You were downtown and I was up on point breeze. So yeah. yeah. Alpha Sig. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think I knew that. I, I think uh, there, there's some guys my age that I think I actually came across your podcast, uh, Dan blank. Um, I think you might, might've had him on mm -hmm. maybe a year or so ago and, I uh, happened to see it on my, of all things, on my Facebook feed. You know, there was a rivalry back in the day between the Betas and the Alpha Sigs. I think as you get older, uh, that, that water smooths itself a little bit. Uh, we were, were pretty common folks, uh, yeah, just different di different places. Well, we're the only two groups that come back in, in the masses. Well, us and Sigma Nu. I can't forget the Sigma Nus. They're always back in the masses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Coach, for sure. it's been a, pr it's been a pr privilege to talk to you, uh, especially – being that you're you're a Bethany alum, so we have that common. Good luck this week against, well, when this episode airs, good luck this week against Hendricks. Um, for those of you that are sticking around, you know what comes next. It's overtime with Serenity Brown where uh, hopefully I'm having a better week because the last two have not been very kind to me in the picking of these games, which I think tells us that Division Three is getting closer from the top and the 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 teams that are, are playing each other. Uh, Coach, again, thank you very much. And we'll be right back, Chuckleheads. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadalina. This is Overtime with Serenity Brown. That's her. Um, we've we've made some progression from last week. Uh, DB went 7-3. and three. It's the first time this year that DB did not do better, do better than, than both of us. Uh, I stayed following you since you beat me the last week. 8-2 and two for the both of us. That brings the standings to DB at 30-10. and 10. Serenity trailing by three games. 27 and 13 and i'm uh, i'm just holding everybody up at the 25 and 15 range uh before we get into this week's picks we want to announce we have started a partnership for the next uh it's two months october 1st through december 24th it's a partnership with qbs versus cancer uh, it's a organization founded by alma quarterback carter st john basically we're going to try to raise as much money as we can in the next two months for, for the fight against cancer. Uh, you can f do, you can donate, find out more about the organization and more by going to quarterbacks versus Uh, so make sure. And if you do decide to donate and you don't have a quarterback in mind, you can just throw the dingo talk name in there. And, uh, the, they really would appreciate if you would make a donation. Um, Jumping into this week's picks, uh, game one, the guest of the week, Rhodes has Hendricks coming to visit them. Uh, coach asked specifically that you break your little segment of not picking the guest of the week. You did, you did just that. Uh, all of us across the board took Hen or took Rhodes. Sorry, not Hendricks. Ooh. <laughs> they were not the guests. Hmm. Uh, second game is WPI at Springfield. Uh, 
Springfield really rolling right now. I think all of us see that here on our show. Yeah. So we all across the board took Springfield. Yes. Now game three, it's where things get a little funky. Uh, Buena Vista, who we had on the show, travels to Nebraska Wesleyan. Serenity did not take them when it was their time, but took them this week. Uh, DB and I took Nebraska Wesleyan. Uh, this is the next game that has a little bit of a difference. It's really the only other game that has a difference. Uh, Beloit travels to Chicago. You and I took Beloit. Uh, DB took it's Chicago. Chicago. Uh, so let's hope. Nothing against Chicago, but let's Nothing hope. against Chicago, but we're hoping that DB loses. <laughs> Nothing against you, buddy, but I'm really tired of seeing you win. So, uh, next game up is Ohio Northern at Marietta. Marietta really rolling so far this year in the OAC. Um, and I don't think there's going to be any different this week. I think that Marietta's geared up and ready to go. Uh, we all took Marietta. Now we get into our ranked games. Uh, number or SUNY Morrisville will travel to Cortland, both friends of the show. Uh, but... We all took Cortland and Coach Fitzpatrick. Uh, Cortland's putting up points. That's what they yeah. do. Um, the next one, and this was the one in my head that I battled for debating on whether it was going to be the game of the week because of how close it is. Number 12, Endicott travels to number 7, Harden-Simmons. Last year, this is the game that put Endicott on the map. Harden-Simmons traveled to them, and they got whomped. Uh, all of us, I believe, took... Oh, no. No, no, You and I took Endicott. DB, staying true to his Texas roots, taking Harden-Simmons. Uh, next up is uw Platteville, number 24, versus number three, UW Lacrosse. Cross the board for lacrosse yeah. um, until somebody beats them. They're the, they're the defending WEAC champions. Um Game before the game of the week, this was also one that I threw out to DB about possibly being a game of the week. North Central, number one, travels to number 18, Wheaton. Um, we have never picked <laughs> against North Central in this show, and that I trend continues. Yeah. Uh, we all picked North Central. And then game of the week, number 17, UW Oshkosh uh, at number 11, UWW. Wisconsin Whitewater. Uh, if you guys didn't figure it out, the WEAC conference schedule opened this week. Yeah. That's why we have uh, them represented. Um, we all took Wisconsin Whitewater. Uh, DB staying true to the statement that he made that he will not pick against Whitewater. Um, and that's how that rolls. So those were our 10 games. That's how we think they're going to play out. Um, we want to take a minute to say thank you very much to Coach Duncan for taking the time. Uh, sorry we didn't get you on the alumni tour back in the day, but it's great to have you on the show this time. And uh, again, if you are willing or able to donate, please make a donation at quarterbacksversuscancer.com. Uh, for the next two months, we're going to be trying to join this fight for cancer with uh, Carter St. John and the rest of the guys over there at QBs v. Cancer. Against. Um, did I not say it right? You said for cancer. I'm, it's against cancer. Well, it's a, you're right. It is against cancer. Thank you for correcting that. Uh, that was a, a misspeak. Yeah. Misspoke. I, Whatever. I debated in my head. <laughs> if you were going to correct me. <laughs> well, just so you know, those aren't grease stains on her shirt. They're water stains. And with that, we'll see you next week, Chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.